Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. It's really lovely to uh, see you all. Uh, welcome to our panel where we'll be talking to three wonderful game designers who are discreetly sitting over here for now uh, about some of their influences, some of the inspirations for their ideas uh, and the, their design practice. Uh, my name is Richard Lamarchand, and I am your moderator for this afternoon's discussion. Um, I'm a game designer by trade. I used to work at Naughty Dog, uh, where I was the lead or the co-lead on the first three Uncharted games. And now I teach game design, development, and production in the USC Games program here in Los Angeles, uh, where I... Woo, yes, thank you very much. Go, you. Uh, uh, where I'm also doing research. Uh, I've started work on a series of experimental games. Um, I announced my new game this spring. It's a weird VR piece inspired by the California light and space movement, and it's got these flowers in it. Uh, and I'm really delighted to have been invited to host this afternoon's panel. Um, the panel is the next chapter in a wonderful uh, and long-standing tradition here at the Indiecade conference. I've always rather wanted to moderate this panel, so it's, uh, I'm very excited about it. And we've assembled three speakers, to, like I said, to tell you about some of the influences that have impacted their work. So I'm very happy to be able to introduce you to them today. Kat Small is a game maker, product designer, and front-end web developer. She started coding around the age of 10 and designing at the age of 15, and alongside the rest of her UX and coding practice has made a bunch of very warmly received independent games. She is the co-founder of the Brooklyn Gamery, uh, who are the creators of Prism Shell and Breakup Squad. Uh, I'll show you a little Breakup Squad in a second. Oh, in fact, and I'll show it to you now. And she makes, also makes awesome things uh, at Etsy, where she's a product designer. Uh, she has done design work for companies of all sizes, including SoundCloud, Bedrocket, and NASDAQ. Uh, and uh, Kat is also an educator. She co-founded and was the executive director of the Code Liberation Foundation, and she helps make steam industries more inclusive uh, with Good for POC. Uh, and you might be interested to search out Kat's website where she has a really fantastic instructional series to help people kind of emerging onto the cultural scene. There's a really great series that you made, Kat, that I checked out about how to become a public speaker. Really valuable materials. Thank you for that. And give it up for Kat. Um, Naomi Clark is a game designer, a creative director, and an educator uh, who has worked with companies from Blue Chip to Indie uh, on titles as diverse as uh, the groundbreaking Sissy Fight 2000, uh, the smash hit game Mismanagement, uh, and the incredible educational game that I'm sure some of you will know, maybe used in your uh, own game learning practice, Game Star Mechanic. She is now a full-time assistant arts professor at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts Game Design Department. Uh, and of course, Naomi's amazing new game about human alien makeout sessions, Consentacle, uh, is currently on Kickstarter. It's fully funded and then some uh, with a couple more days to go. So don't miss out on. Uh, and thank you very much, Celia, because you can play it right outside this room for the remainder of the weekend. So welcome, Naomi. And Jason Raw is a prolific artist and game designer known for a long string of groundbreaking games, uh, uh, which probably many of you have studied in school, uh, which include Passage, Gravitation, Inside a Starfield Sky, The Castle Doctrine, uh, and Cordial Minuet, uh, a magic numbers game with strange overtones. Uh, his work was recently featured at the Davis Museum at Wellesley College in a show that was the first museum retrospective wholly dedicated to the work of a single video game maker. Jason is now hard at work on his new game, One Hour, One Life, which is a generational online multiplayer game. Welcome, Jason. So the theme of today's panel, like I say, is very straightforward. Each of our speakers is going to tell us a little about their influences, but with something of a twist. Game designers often talk about other games when we're speaking about our, the influences on our work, but today's session is a bit different. Our, our guests are going to tell us about their non-games influences. So I am going to pass over to Kat, who is going to get the ball rolling. Um, please welcome Kat Small. I am short. 
There we go. Hello. How's it going? <laughs> Yay. Uh, so I'm Kat. We already did the intro. That was cool. Uh, so I make awkward games. Uh, <laughs> a few of the other awkward games I've made. Uh, so my first solo game was called Train Jumper, and I made that a couple of years ago uh, at this point. Wow. Uh, and the goal was pretty straightforward. You need to get to the train in time, and you have to like jump over people and kind of kick them out of the way, and it gets really hilarious and awkward. Uh, the, another game that I made uh, was called Five Stages, and in it you play through the five stages of dealing with a breakup. Um, at the beginning of the game, it asks for your name and then the name of your most recent ex, and then throughout the game, it actually uh, spits out that ex's name, so my ex was actually called Kevin, so that was fun. Um, and then there was Breakup Squad, which I got to show yesterday night here, which is really cool. A uh, five-player game where two people play as exes and three other people play as the friends trying to keep them apart. <laughs> uh, and another game I'm working on currently is called Sweetheart. And uh, this game is a little bit more depressing. Uh, it's about race, gender, and microaggressions. Um, and it's solely focused on uh, specifically things that uh, women of color face. Um, you go through a week of playing as a college-age woman of color. Uh, her name is Kara. It's basically me. Surprise. Um, and you get to do things like dressing up, and then you get to go outside and see how people react to you on the street, and then at your job, etc. It's really fun. Um, and the goal of the game is to get through the week without uh, feeling, you know, you want to feel less stressed. So that's been an interesting experiment in what is a game, the classic question. Um, now that you know a little bit more about some of the things that I've worked on, I wanted to talk about four things that inspire me. Um, so firstly, I was born in New York City, uh, specifically the Bronx, and I've pretty much been there my entire life. I'm not leaving. Uh, I know this place intimately, and it's really an interesting space. Uh, there are too many people in New York. Uh, it's ridiculous. Uh, there's just, it's, it keeps growing. Somehow people keep moving there. And uh, because of that, we are really into personal space and boundaries. And I absolutely love exploring these concepts in my games. Uh, so like I mentioned, that first game that I made uh, was about uh, getting to the subway on time. And it's a very common occurrence that people are just always in your way. Uh, there are lots of unspoken rules and people really don't know them. <laughs> All the people that are new to New York are just coming in and there's like this culture clash of sorts. Um, there's like a lot of discomfort and it's really interesting to kind of exist when, in this space where it's like you know these things but other people don't. Um, and so something I love to do is like work throughout my games uh, to kind of explore some of those things a little bit. Uh, so I'd say the theme there is contrast. Um, and I think contrast really powers awkwardness which is something if you can't tell that I really enjoy in video games. Uh, secondly, uh, surprise, relationships. I really love thinking about them. Um, my parents divorced when I was a kid and they still talk sometimes, which is really uncomfortable in a way because it's like, they're kind of like, hmm, maybe I should make unhealthy choices. And then I'm like, no, don't, please. Please don't talk to each other anymore. Um, which is partially the inspiration for Breakup Squad, but also that's a very normal thing that happens to lots of people. Um, Additionally, just thinking about interpersonal relationships in general, how personalities connect and interact with each other, um, and why do people make the decisions that they do? Why do people, um, you know, kind of uh, meet with the people they do and uh, befriend the people that they do? And this is probably why I also love dramatic TV shows such as Korean dramas. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'd say the theme there is intimacy, uh, because there's something really interesting about making games that feel uh, very personal and perhaps a little bit uncomfortable. My third inspiration is the high school that I got to go to. It is called LaGuardia High School. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but it's a very strange place. <laughs> um, it is so weird that they made a movie about it in 1980, and it is called Fame. So I don't know if any of you have seen Fame. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Such a strange movie. But yeah, pretty accurate. Uh, firstly, uh, it's in New York, but it's just a really, really diverse school. New York is uh, known as like one of the places where they're, it's like really, really segregated when it comes to schools a lot of the time. So it's actually really special that LaGuardia was so diverse. Um, and that was me on the right uh, exploring my emo phase. Um, <laughs> and people were cool with that, you know? It was like, 
normal. Um, and attending LaGuardia made me feel like diversity was expected, it was normal, um, and it made me realize that like I want to see more of that in the things that I'm creating. So I aim to make all of my games um, as much as I can include diverse characters and for it to feel natural. It was also really weird, as I mentioned. Um, everyone was free to express themselves, and again, it was an expected, understood thing, which I feel like is really weird, because before I got to high school, I was watching those movies about high school, and people were like punching the weird kids and like throwing them into lockers, and that was not my experience at all. Uh, so it really actually let me lean into my weirdness and be a little bit proud of uh, just being a really strange person, and I'm actually quite proud of that really terrible photo of me that I found on Facebook. Dear God. <laughs> so I'd say that the theme here is counterculture. Um, and I just, yeah, I love the strangeness. I like breathe and live on it. Um, and my final inspiration, if you know me, this is so obvious. Uh, but I love Sailor Moon so much that I have a neck tattoo that's inspired by that and the Sega Genesis controller at the same time. Hello. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> hey. So, uh, firstly, Sailor Moon had incredible fashion. Um, a lot of the episodes in the, uh, I think it was like 200 episode series, uh, had different outfits for each character, uh, which is really challenging. Like, making up all these different pieces of clothing took a lot of work, but it was recognized. Um, and Sailor Moon was actually the thing that got me into dress-up dolls, which is the first thing that I actually coded. Uh, so this was one of the things that really helped me get here. Strange. Um, and it also uh, was a really, uh, it was an ahead of its time show, but it was also really good at the time that it came out. So it wasn't one of those things like the Sega Saturn where it was like, oh, this is really cool, but not, not where it needed to be at the time. So um, it really power, like highlighted the power of girls and women. Um, and the show had princesses, but the princesses were saving themselves. Um, they were saving the world. And I really liked that concept. Like, girls hear a lot about like princesses when they're kids. Um, they're like told that they need to be princesses. But I really loved the idea of subverting those expectations of what a princess was supposed to do. Um, so I try to do that in my own work and figure out like areas where I can kind of go against what people think is going to happen, um, but using it in a way that hopefully feels uh, interesting and, and makes people think a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then finally, the transformation sequences were always amazing. Um, they were always so interesting and different, and I always loved, like, I don't know, there was something really beautiful about kind of seeing someone go from whatever they were wearing to this whole new magical amazing outfit. Um, and it's definitely, uh, like the visual flourishes and the sound design that they used uh, definitely inspire a lot of the things that I try to do. Um, and in Sweetheart, there's, after you dress up, there's like a little part where you're kind of like, yay, like I love this outfit or I don't love this outfit. And it's kind of a little bit of a reference uh, to this show, which I love very much. Uh, so I'd say generally a theme with Sailor Moon for me was definitely uh, cutting edge. As I mentioned, the show managed to be relevant during the time that it came out, but it was also very, very future forward. And uh, there were definitely parts that got weird in the show. Uh, if you watch the entire series or you read the books, you know this. Um, but there was a lot of good in it, and it definitely was overall a very great and inspiring series. And there are definitely things that uh, still inspire me when I go back, like I rewatched the show a couple of years ago, and I learned a lot just from looking at it again, and I get inspired repeatedly by that show. So these are the four things that uh, definitely inspire a lot of the things that I do. And what I'm hoping that I'm doing is making weird, personal, and unexpected video games. And uh, I hope that people uh, around me are hopefully a little bit inspired by that and continue to lean into these themes. And that's why I'm really happy to be at IndieKid, which is definitely the epicenter of these kinds of things. So thank you. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you so much, Kat, for getting us off to a great start. Jason, you are up next. Uh, when you're ready, you can press the right arrow key to show slide. your slide. Yeah. <laughs> Please welcome Jason Rowe. I've got to raise the mic now. Um, is that, you guys, can, I'm pretty loud, so I think that's probably going to pick me up just fine. All right, yeah. Um, so I don't even know if I need the mic, maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, from, <laughs> from the diary. 
Uh, yeah, so I am doing something a little different in that I'm not going to talk about uh, what really influences me today as much as like sort of what kind of maybe set me off on my trajectory as a young person um, when I kind of became aware of, I guess what I would call um, sort of like uh, art, art, maybe like artistically uh, potent commercial work. Um, you can imagine as someone who, you know, I was born in 1977, I was growing up in Ohio, um, uh, when I was, you know, 1994, the, the two works that I'm going to talk about uh, came out in 1994, and that's when I was 16 years old, almost about to turn 17. Um, and this is kind of realizing, yes, this was, this was pre-internet, um, in that I think we had America Online at home, but you could only look at America Online things and check email. I don't think America Online had web access yet. And back then, even if you did have web access, there wasn't anything on it, really. Um, so you know, all the things that we sort of take for granted today as conduits for culture and also uh, you know, establishing niches of interest um, didn't exist at all, right? So we had Camelot Records at Summit Mall, <laughs> which is like where we went to buy music. Um, Camelot Records was a chain, you know, and uh, you'd walk in there and you'd buy compact discs or, or tapes. Um, and then we had uh, the only access to movies that we really had uh, was the multiplex, right? Um, so there wasn't an art theater that was available to me. I guess I, I could have driven up to Cleveland, but I was too young to really do that. Um, so we weren't exposed to any independent cinema or anything. I know that stuff existed back then, but we didn't have it. Um, so, um, uh, so I'm just going to put up a slide so you guys can see these. But I have my original artifacts here. So 1994. Um, so uh, the downward spiral, <laughs> uh, which is Nine Inch Nails album. Uh, this is, I think, you know, Trent Reznor's, depending on how you count, like third album. Um, and it was, you know, his biggest commercial success with the song Closer, which made it to mainstream radio, just shockingly, right, uh, at the time. And, and the video also was played regularly on MTV, um, also very sh shocking in terms of structure, uh, content, and so on, compared to most mainstream music videos at the time. Um, and so for me, as a, like, budding sort of interested in art and ex creative kind of stuff and experimentation 16-year-old, you know, to have this kind of thing on the radio and to be able to go down to like Camelot Records, I think is probably where it doesn't have the sticker on it anymore, but uh, still has the Tipper sticker, the parental advisory, which is <laughs> uh, named after Tipper Gore, who got it put on there. Um, but uh, you know, even the you can't, I, I don't have any slides showing it, but this is a uh, you know a painting on the cover. I mean, it almost looks like a stain on a, a mental hospital wall or something. That's what I always thought it was. Um, but the the you know the the jacket and so on is filled with. Uh, uh, art from this artist who I, I'm not even familiar with his uh, name, but um, uh, you know, just kind of encountering like you know, the back of the album has teeth and salt trails. It's like a kind of a painting slash sculpture with I think human teeth mounted in it. Um, and and um, and the content of the album was extremely. I just listened to it in the car ride over from the airport a couple days ago. Um, very. Uh, experimental and wide ranging and changing stylistically and you know incorporating all sorts of weird sonic textures and and to me as a 16 year old this was sort of unprecedented right um, and so that was my first sort of doorway into this world of you know this is very commercial art I mean Trent Reznor was very successful commercial mu musician um, also the other thing to note about it is that he it wasn't really a band right I mean it's sort of called it's called Nine Inch Nails but that was really his name for him um, and he had people on stage, I can name some of them, but they were always changing. Some of them went off to form other bands and things that were just sort of his, his touring band. But pretty much the content of this, he sat down and kind of worked on himself almost like, you know, a, a sort of a singular artist, and that was sort of unusual. So um, the other uh, thing I'm going to talk about briefly is up there on the screen, uh, Natural Born Killers. And this, you know, coincidentally came out right around the same time. Um, and... Also, uh, Trent Reznor, uh, this is an Oliver Stone film, so of course we're all probably still familiar with Oliver Stone, he's still making movies today. Um, and at the time, you know, Oliver Stone was extremely well known and well respected for things like uh, JFK, Born on the Fourth of July, um, these very sort of um, politically, uh, politically themed um, films and films kind of driven in part by his own experience um, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and he was sort of cultivating a style, sort of an experimental style that I feel like really sort of reached its apex with this film. I mean, this film, I, most people probably haven't seen it because it's a slightly more obscure film. It's also very violent and very disturbing. Um, but 
stylistically, it's wildly, wildly experimental to the point where I don't think like, I've seen another film since that is dabbling in so many different palettes, so many different camera angles, so many different film stocks, so many different technique, visual techniques, non-digital, non he wasn't using CG, but um, there's scenes where you're watching actors on the screen and there's a projector playing other stuff on scenery behind them, including words that are coming across their chest sometimes and they walk through the projection. Um, uh, all sorts of really interesting stuff that I just, slow motion and weird spots and even bits of anime <laughs> in certain spots to illustrate emotional content just all of a sudden, like in the middle of the movie, a bit of anime comes in that doesn't even look like the characters or like a crazy interpretation of the characters just to sort of show emotional content of the characters and then it goes away and it's, it's only there for, I'd say, like 10 seconds. Um, and so my mother, I was telling Richard this uh, earlier a couple of days ago, um, my mother warned me. I was 16 years old. My parents didn't let me see R-rated movies until I was 16. That was their rule. You're old enough to date. That was also their rule. You had to be 16 to date. 16, you can go on dates. We're not going to stop you from seeing R-rated movies. I know the, technically you have to be 17, but they're going to let you in. And, and so, yeah, you're allowed to see them now. And this was like one of the first. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go see this one, Mom. <laughs> and my mom was an Oliver Stone fan, right? I mean, she is an intellectual. She's actually a computer programmer um, and very up on culture and always reading the newspaper and keeping up with things. And, and so she, had, she loved JFK and Born on the Fourth of July and these things. But she had read about this, I guess, because she was like, Jason, I know you can see R-rated movies, but this movie is a film that, was, that came out of, the, out of a mind that has been warped by drugs. <laughs> so keep that in mind, you know, don't get warped, you know. Uh, and you know, I don't know if she had read it, but there is backstory here that Oliver Stone and one of his producers, I think, were like tripping on shrooms out in the, in the, uh, in the uh, New Mexico desert um, on, on Highway 666, which is where the movie takes place. And there is a mushroom scene in the movie. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, and the other thing about this film is um, that it's a, it's an essay in film form, right? To have an essay in film form at a multiplex in like rural slash suburban Ohio, I mean, the, he's, he's, he's making an argument, uh, he has a thesis in here about, uh, you know, the complicit nature of media's obsession with uh, violent individuals uh, perpetuating our fear and uh, prison culture and, um, and kind of turning these people into superstars that sort of get celebrated, which is still, you know, something that we're still kind of wrestling with as a society today with the more recent shootings and things that have happened. Um, you know, how much attention to give these people? Um, do we do, do a whole interview with them eventually? Um, people who are on death row or, you know, Charles Manson is another great example who's had lots of media exposure, lots of interviews, little mini documentaries made um, to the point where you almost seem obsessed with them, right? Uh, America's Most Wanted in these kinds of shows. So for me as a 16-year-old to go into the multiplex and sort of realize that this film had a very specific, I mean, it wasn't like on the nose, he didn't speak it out, no character ever like uttered it, right? Um, but that it was clear that it was constructed for a reason to, to sort of deliver an argument and that um, was like, oh, never seen anything like this. And you know, even to this day, in terms of mainstream movies, that's pretty, pretty rare, right? Um, and so those things together, you know, they were right at this very formative time for me. They sort of opened my eyes to the potential of these things that are otherwise very commercial forms, right? And I still think, even though there's free games and there's small games that are given away and so on, video games historically especially have been a, primarily like, like this commercial medium that we can sort of use or kind of co-opt to make more artistic things or more expressive things. Um, and so these are early examples of that and sort of like, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe we could do that with games too, right? Maybe these things that, these, these big plastic cartridges that are manufactured at a factory somewhere and plugged into, you know, these, these devices that we bought at the department store, um, you know, could those be used to, uh, to deliver content that, you know, has these qualities to it? Thank you. Please welcome Naomi Clark. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm here pinch hitting for Zoe Quinn, who couldn't be here. Uh, but since, since we already uh, plugged my game up on the screen, I'll just say, you should buy Crash Override, her book. It's great. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I made this talk up uh, two hours ago out of a bunch of stuff I had lying around. So we'll see how this goes. So uh, five years ago, I was actually on the Influences talk in 2012. And I think I talked about three influences, which for me are just like whatever happens to be seething in my head. 
Uh, and one of my influences was comic books, and that, that's still, still an influence. Uh, it's evolved a little bit since then, probably in, in bad ways. So I'll, I'm just going to go a little bit deeper into that and talk about how it's, uh, how it's messing me up. Um, so back when I was the... Actually, around the same time that Jason was buying the Nine Inch Nails album and, uh, and considering... I guess you were stopped from watching Natural Born Killers? Oh, you, oh, you went and saw it. Excellent. Yeah, so um, I was like a, a snotty kid uh, in, in a larger city in Seattle. Uh, so I, ha I had very definite opinions about, about popular culture. And like, well, you know, I would, I, I, think I, I think I bought the Nine Inch Nails album. I, I'm a little bit older than, than Jason. So I think my opinion was like, oh, this is this kind of like overly edgy stuff. <laughs> like you're trying really hard. Uh, yeah. And uh, so, but... I'd read comic books back then, but I would only read these kinds of comic books. These are all sort of like indie titles from the 90s uh, or, or shortly thereafter. It's like, okay, you're a cool kid with taste. You're you know, reading these autobiographical things or these kind of very like deconstructed artsy uh, comic books like Violent Cases by uh, Dave McKean. Super weird, depressing stuff like uh, Yummy Fur, which, which I guess is kind of the Trent Prisoner equivalent. Um, <laughs> And so I, I absolutely would not read superhero comics when, when I was growing up. I, I wasn't allowed to, actually, when I was younger. They were, like, too violent. And then was, by the time I was a teenager, I was too snotty to read that stuff. But uh, in the 2010s, I really started to think, oh, you know, there's such an interesting, weird cultural phenomenon going on. I, I kind of want to understand superhero comics a little bit better. I was... Uh, kind of recruited into reading superhero comics by uh, Darius Kazemi, who uh, many of uh, folks at IndieCade know, and, and Courtney Stanton. Uh, and so I started to realize, oh, there's this whole very uh, rich, interconnected world. I, I started reading DC Comics, uh, and then I switched over to Marvel Comics for various structural reasons that had nothing to do with loyalty. Um, but I, uh, around the time of five years ago when I was doing that influences talk, I started reading all of the Marvel Comics. So, uh, and tracking them with the assistance of this website that sort of has all of these stats. So it's, uh, it's been like four, no, actually, sorry, it's, it's only been three and a half years that I've been reading all the Marvel comics. I think I've, got, I've read about 175,000 pages from the very beginning to the end, and about 9,100 9, comics so far. So I'm reading them all in order also. So why, why am I doing this? It's sort of a brain-destroying exercise. Uh, and I, I don't even know why, right? Um, but I learned some things along the way. I was like, okay, I pulled some stuff out of this. And one thing is I, I, I sort of understand a little bit more, I think, actually, about American culture in general. It's not all, like, wonderful things to learn. But uh, there, I, I noticed some weird phenomenon. I think I, I understand it a little bit better, also from my experience making games. Uh, one is the reaction to, to this. This is a uh, Captain America controversy from last year when Captain America was revealed to have always been uh, a sleeper agent of, of HYDRA, the Nazi organization. And this, uh, this upset a lot of people. And I was like, okay, this is really interesting. Like, why is this so upsetting? Because I like, I'd never read Captain America comic books before a few years ago, right? So I don't, I don't have this like deep-seated loyalty, but I had been like, reading all of the Captain America comic books since the beginning. And I was like, this doesn't seem that weird to me. I mean... You know, like, back in the 40s and then in the 60s again, they had, like, you know, Captain America became a Nazi, and, like, he sig heiled Hitler. And, like, this is Jack Kirby drawing this, like, the, the creator of the comic. And he's like, oh, did you know? Well, what's going to happen? Captain America becomes a Nazi. And then in, the, in, like, the early 80s, then he actually, his shield gets a swastika on it. Uh, and so it's like, this stuff should be upsetting. Um... And of course, this is all sort of like he's mind controlled for a while, right? It's actually like a classic recurring Captain America plot that he's mind controlled into becoming a Nazi. And then he used to be like, no, no, I might believe in America instead, right? <laughs> so that's, that's just what happens to this guy. Uh, it's even in, like, in these like, animated movies for kids just a few years before this happened. So why was this so upsetting? This, this uh, comic book from last year where he was revealed to have always been a sleeper agent. Of course, this has been undone now. A, a backup drive of Captain America, literally like a cosmic backup drive, came back with a sleeper sword. We were like, let's get rid of this, this version. Um, and I think it was actually because the, uh, the creators of this comic and the, and the editors talking about it were... It, insisting that this was not going to be undone, like nothing was going to happen, that they were going to break this kind of unspoken covenant that everyone understands, like, oh, this superhero's dead, they're probably going to come back to life, 
You know, you have a cliffhanger where you're like, oh no, will you be able to save your little sidekick? Maybe he's gonna die. And you're like, okay, I, I know, probably. He's gonna save him in the next issue. Um, and they were trying to say like, no, not this time. And, um, and it really annoyed a lot of people. Uh, but it was hard to figure that out. A lot of people were, have talked about this like, no, actually, it's just the, the fact that you would make Captain America into a Nazi is offensive, which isn't true. And so I interviewed a bunch of people about this. I was like, okay, so did you read these other comic books? What do you think of these? And everyone was like, yeah, well, it's, actually, it's not actually that he's becoming a Nazi. It's, it's not just that. It's that they're trying to, to, to tell everyone, like, no, this time it's really real. It's not going to go back. And that that's sort of insulting because it's, it's like a bald-faced lie, for one thing. Uh, and an obvious marketing gimmick, and it also seems like very crass in this way. That all of these things are kind of crass, but most of them are are sort of undone relatively quickly, and the audience is kind of clued in on it. So uh, to me, I think this has a lot to do with uh, with spoilers and sort of understanding like wh what is a spoiler? Is it a spoiler if I tell you like, oh, Captain America, he does, he's not a Nazi anymore now, right? It's like, oh my gosh, I wasn't sure if the if the comic book company was going to literally just destroy one of its most popular characters forever, right? Uh, and, but people have a funny relationship to spoilers. They, they really don't like them. But one of the things that I wanted to say today is, actually, no, spoilers are really good for you. You might, you might uh, think that they're terrible and that you want to avoid them at all costs or get upset when you see them, but you should think of them as being like vitamins. They, are, they may taste bad. They may sort of be like, yeah, I don't know if I want to eat this. But actually, they're good for you and your taste. And they're actually good for the world because they actually make our taste slightly better. So let me, let me quickly explain what this is before you get all like, no, take that screen off. I didn't know that Snape killed Dumbledore. <laughs> um, so this is actually something that's been researched uh, down at UC San Diego by a psychologist named Nicholas Christenfeld. He's, he had a bunch of people read different stories from different genres. And it turns out that overall, like if... if for most people, on average, uh, the having a story spoiled, the ending, or I tell you what's going to happen, kind of like you know, you're reading a TV guide description and it's like, you know, two lovers quarrel and it ends in death, you know, then that kind of spoiler where you find out someone dies, um, or even more explicit than that, like a wife kills her husband at the end of this, this show, like actually increases the, the pleasure that people are self-reporting at reading the story. And this, this is true, even if you get spoiled in the middle of a story, it's still you end up liking it better. Uh, and like, so pe this was very controversial. There are people arguing about this, psychologists are arguing about this still. And I think part of what's going on here is that there are actually two different kinds of pleasure you can get from a story. Uh, and I think this is actually pretty relevant for games too, although I've been looking at a lot of research mostly about, uh, about you know, written stories or, or TV series or movies. Uh, this, the, the pleasure that's represented here in the light blue bars is the pleasure of like not having it spoiled for you. So I would call this, this is the pleasure that comes from the plot, right? So you find out like, oh, I don't know what happens. Now, now I see what happens. A plot point has been revealed and I found out like, oh my gosh, there's a twist. Or I found out who, who, kill, who the killer was. And this is a, what I would describe it as a form of structural pleasure. It's uh, something that writers know how to craft into it. They're following various kinds of formats of like, so, okay, we're going to hint at something, foreshadow this, and then we're going to reveal it more fully, or there's going to be various types of twists. You might be able to think of some writers, M. Night Shyamalan, right, who like rely very heavily on this kind of thing. Uh, but it's quite different from the type of pleasure that I think is, re is represented or at least accounts for some of the difference in the blue bar where, in theory, some of that plot pleasure, of, at least of being surprised, is taken away. And now you kind of know. You know what the reveal is in the blue bar. Uh, and I would, I would go as far as to describe this as like you're actually appreciating it in a different way because you sort of understand, oh, this is the shape of this. I'm being told what's going to happen. Much as you, would, you know the plot of Romeo and Juliet if you go and watch a production of that, right? Or if you've driven down a road you have driven down many times before, you kind of like know, like, oh, maybe around the next bend, uh, you know, there are some, there's a stand of trees there that I've seen before. Uh, so you're looking at it repeat, uh, in some sort of repeated way, or maybe you've, you've kind of dreamt about it first, and then you're seeing it again in front of your face. And then now you, you, you connect those dots. And what Kristenfeld says is, oh, actually, there's a lot of 
various types of information from many places. It's not all information from within the story, but it's other things that you've heard about it, reviews, trailers, uh, that you're using to construct your framework of how, how do I understand and how do I appreciate and take pleasure from this. So the theory is that the, uh, having a spoiler given to you gets fed into all of that surrounding structure that you use to understand what your experience is. And so you, I think you can appreciate the texture a little bit better. And so that's why I say, yeah, you should, you should expose yourself to spoilers sometimes. You should actually maybe not, at least not get super upset because what's happening is you've substituted one type of pleasure for another. I'm not saying it's always better, but at least you, know, you ought to be able to, to taste both. And I think that's really relevant for games because for me, the, the equivalent of an unexpected plot twist or a cool new plot point that happens uh, is, is probably something like, meaningful choices that make a difference to the game, right? Like, and so there, there are a lot of fans increasingly seem to despise uh, Telltale's game style as the word has gotten out that when you make various kinds of choices, well, the, what, it doesn't affect the game. It doesn't lead to a completely different ending, right? And then a lot of these choices really, they, they affect the texture of the game, your understanding of who, who the character Lee is and like what kind of person he is and how that might be sort of individual to your, your particular play session. Uh, to me, that's a, there's a little bit of a relationship there between that and the plot spoilers because if you, if you take these choices seriously, whether or not you think, oh, they're being recorded in a save state that's going to come back and like ripple into consequences in the game later, uh, if, you, if you let go of that, then I think you actually appreciate the texture of making this choice uh, in a serious way in the moment whether or not anything else happens. Of course, and we can sort of go further and say, oh, with a game like Proteus, where you know, some people would say, well, you know, how can we consider this a game? There's not, no structure there. You know, I'm not making meaningful choices. I'm just experiencing a landscape. Of course, you know, these debates have gone on for a while. I think it just points out to us that you know, we, we shouldn't get too attached to ideas of what we think we like or where we're taking pleasure from it. And my experience is from watching a lot of people play games over the years is that we have no idea why we like things. Very little, we have very little access to our own minds or why, what we like about something, whether we would like it if it's different. We're probably more clueless than those who know us the best. So my, the watchword I would suggest is that least well do we comprehend our own pleasure. I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you so much, Naomi. Do you want to come up and take a seat for a moment? Uh, we actually only have a second left. Um, uh, when I was 12, Paul Hudson, a school friend of mine, spoiled Empire Strikes Back uh, about uh, Han Solo being, well, you know what happens to Han Solo. Um, what, as I was spoiling Empire Strikes Back for myself by reading the novelization a full nine months before it came out in British cinemas. So. <laughs> Um, thank you. Uh, so folks, I had a couple of prepared questions and I will pitch them at our panelists, but since we only have seven or eight minutes left for our panel, I'd love to throw open the floor to you all for our questions, for preferably one for all of our panelists, but maybe a more targeted one, yes. I do have a targeted one. That's fine. Uh -oh. Okay. Um, maybe brief. Very brief, yeah. Um, to uh, Naomi, actually. Um, what would you say about games that are specific towards the surprise or something or something that a game that's designed for um, some type of subversion of the kind of spoiler? Uh, what pops into my mind is something like Bioshock and the, the reveal in the mid of that game. Um, would you say that that would be either like uh, something different or? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good question. I mean, that, that game clearly, when it was designed, was, was trying to put that ingredient in there in a strong way. Uh, I don't think you need it in order to enjoy that game. I had that game spoiled for me before I played it. And it, I, you know, I don't really think I, it would have made a big difference. I'm, I'm a person who's pretty has low interest in that kind of spoiler pleasure, though, right? I'm like, OK, I didn't know that. Fine, that's, that's fine. It's actually maybe dec makes it a little bit more annoying for me if there's a plot twist. So uh, I, it, it does a little bit depend on, on your tastes. What I'm trying to say is partially you should try and push the boundaries of what you can enjoy uh, in order be, not to focus too heavily on one of those over the other. And from the point of view of creating, I think you, know, you should use whatever you want. But also keep in mind that you know, maybe it's okay for your game to be spoiled and there still is a lot of richness in all of the choices that you made while making the game that, that will still be enjoyed, and you don't have to rest everything on, on that, right? 
So I was I was thinking as I listened to Naomi's talk that um, a spoiler is I never thought of this until I heard her speaking, but a spoiler is kind of a form of out, outside the work dramatic irony, right? Where you 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 become aware of something the characters aren't aware of, or something like if you saw Sixth Sense knowing it the whole time. You're looking for things and you're appreciating all these clues. And in fact, some of those movies are better the second time, right? I mean, right. I would say, yeah. like, you know, Memento might be better the second time. It because, is better. Yeah, or yeah, or the like, usual suspects, I think, is often the usual suspects. suspects because then you notice all these things that the authors are putting in there that you, you had no way of noticing, um, which is a, is a pleasure. I mean, dram you know, dramatic irony is one of the great pleasures of, of, of work, right? Yeah, and I mean, I will also say, like, a lot of people watch people play video games on the internet now, and then they still want to go enjoy it for themselves mm -hmm. for a different reason, which I think is really interesting. So people will find joy in things in different ways. You were great, yes. Uh, Ted Dinola has a question. Hi guys, thanks for sharing already. You talked about some, some media that you all really enjoyed, um, but one thing that I, I think that has always been super important is finding media that you really dislike and finding out why that's important. Can you share maybe some anti-influences that like are really important things to go and watch. Re Ready Not Player One by Ernest time. Klein oh, no. is the, <laughs> it is, it's the worst book about games ever written and it will be the worst film about games ever made. You should protest it. Oh Kat and Jason, do you have a response? Oh, to, the, to Ted's general theme, what about? I mean, I'm right in the middle of this right now. I had no. Uh oh, uh oh. I had a, and also, maybe, a spoiler. No, I'm not going to spoiler anything. <laughs> I thought I would love Blade Runner 2049, and I did not. But now I'm bursting with ideas about it that I want to discuss with people. So it's not. No, I don't. <laughs> Folks, what do you think? Anything I, I, to say I'll, around that? Something this? just popped into my mind. So I would say. Um, kind of anti influences. Yeah, or yeah. Like that. Most non Pixar 3D animated movies. Like, I'm just like, I mean, I have little kids, you know, and we'd go to see some of these things, but I'm just like, wow, you guys really don't care about story or, well, didn't, you, didn't you hire any, hire any harsh, writers? Harsh, harsh. <laughs> uh, what, which one? Leica. I have yeah. not, I don't Kubo know. Kubo and the Two Strings? Kubo and the Two Strings. So, Coraline? Uh, well, yeah, well, those are stop motion, so I was saying 3D animated. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, now, Kubo is a great example, and I saw Coraline and really liked it. Kubo is a great example where I felt like, um, they spent so much, like, well, these things take so much time and effort that they could have done something a little better with the story, right? And, and then the beginning of Kubo and the dramatic moments that occur in the beginning were so strong and amazing, and they felt by the end it kind of like they didn't really, uh, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, there are definitely, I, I, there's like various shows at various points in time where it's like I watch it, I try to watch it, and then I hate it for some reason, and then I really work hard to like understand what that is. Um, a semi-recent example, hilariously enough, we're in a video game space, is the anime, I think it's called Gamers. And yeah, there are lots of little parts of it where I was kind of like, wow, why do I hate this? And it, I realized like, part of it is like, it's on one hand, they actually portrayed video games really well. Like they actually got some video games. Like I think they have, um, Guilty Gear in there, and I was like, oh, that's really cool. Like, they actually have Guilty Gear, and they actually explain the mechanics, um, but there are parts of it that are just, uh, they're like kind of pandering a little bit to the audience, and so I was kind of like, eh. Um, and then I'm trying to think of another one. Um, yeah, there's just like, I, I really enjoy like watching these kinds of shows and like starting to like explore uh, like, why don't I like this? And what can I learn from this and that I won't do in, in my own work that I'm creating? So yeah, I mean, from, for example, gamers, I learned like, yes, um, it's kind of similar, I guess, to like Ready Player One, where it's like, they're a little bit, they can be a little bit nail on the head with things sometimes. Mm -hmm. And there's like a way of creating stuff where you can like reference those kinds of things, but you don't have to be like, I too make or like play video games, you know? Like, I too love video games, I mean, fellow gamers. I mean, Ready Player One has footnotes just to remind yeah. you of the references, right? <laughs> <laughs> And sometimes I find when there's something that I should kind of on paper love, but I don't for some reason, it is productive because it helps me get clearer about what I do like and then what I do want to say. So thanks for a great question, Ted. Do we have one more question to close us out? So this is kind of a riff off of the last question, but um, what are your guilty pleasure influences? Like the things that you know you shouldn't keep referencing because it's really dumb like I, oh I i keep referencing things from like the movie terminator or something and i'm like i really should stop doing that but i, I do it all the time anyway so what about that 
Thanks, Tristan. What do you think, folks? <laughs> Guilt. I, I don't think we should dwell in shame. I think we should just own, <laughs> own our so-called guilty pleasures. Does anyone have one? You can pass. You're all welcome to pass. We're pretty much I, out of time. I mean, I guess I sort of shared shared my like weird, meaningless binge eating of like every Marvel comic. So that that kind of counts. Right. But guilty. That's pretty. Yeah. Guilty. Um, I mean, that's like I, I do that even when it hurts. I just keep trying to read them. But um, I get my other the one that I have been thinking about a lot lately is obscure things that I know people won't know, but I just want to put in there. Mm -hmm. uh, like I, I don't know. I think. I keep referencing stuff from Japanese culture occasionally because I I, gr I grew up there uh, on and off and I'm, and then I realize oh wait people don't know what Japanese subway ads look like uh, or you know like is there really should I put some weird stuff in here that's just a reference or a pun that nobody will understand right. I don't know what's compelling me to do that but I know that it's not not really reaching very many people yeah. <laughs> but it's yeah I mean I'm a fan of like. Uh, talking a lot about tech in my games because that's like the space that I exist within and I'm sure that sometimes like I hope that people who also work or exist in tech will like sometimes play my games and like cringe at how like terrible tech can be sometimes um, like with the buzzwords and like all those kinds of things around the way that people exist in that space um, so I'd say that and then otherwise memes I should probably stop it referencing <laughs> memes at some point maybe, maybe. <laughs> no no <laughs> Uh, I don't know. This is kind of too obvious, right? But like, uh, like the broom. The broom. <laughs> oh, oh, hi. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, Do you so, mean uh, the the not uh, the movie, movie Room? Not oh, the hey. movie Room about the woman locked in the. Uh, Tommy, Tommy, Tommy Wiseau's yeah. the room. Yes. You're tearing me apart. Uh, anyone yeah, have yeah. Um, plastic forks so you know, with them? So I mean, I I think um, you know, uh, there's like uh, Pauline Clail the. The film critic uh, said something like, "You know, if you if you if you can't appreciate good trash, you're not going to get very much out of watching movies, right?" <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the room is an extreme example. Um, but just uh, you know, taking a work um, at its, you know, so what it's intended to be, and not overly critiquing or not like piling on uh, too much uh, expectation is is. I mean, there's a lot of things that I, I, I'm having trouble naming them, but I sort of feel like, oh yes, there's these things that I, I, mean, I don't know, like you know, t going back and watching a film like Back to the Future, right, and just saying like, you know, this is a sort of wonderful thing that is creative in many ways, but also very cheesy in many ways. But it doesn't really matter. It's like its own thing, and it, that's what it wanted to be. And and yeah. we don't have to we don't have to you know question the, the the prosthetic makeup or something and whether it looks realistic, right? We just kind of bask in it, right? Yeah, no no guilt or shame yeah. at Indiecade. We can own the things <laughs> that we love. We love them authentically.